Okay, I would like, now like to call to order the uh, September 30th special meeting of the Inland Wireless Commission. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to have uh, Commission and staff introduce themselves. I'm Don Goodrich, Chairman. Peter Smart, Act Commissioner. Luke David Altman. Laura Ferguson, Commissioner. <coughs> Dave McCollum, Inland Watman's Agent. Kathy Dallas, Recording Secretary. Beth Kavak, now Planning Director. Okay. And I would like to thank you for your patience. We've been waiting for another member who was running late coming from work. We feel we have to start now. He should be coming in momentarily, and he will join us at the start. Um, the only thing on the agenda tonight is the discussion of the application for Good Hill Road, and we will begin the meeting with presentation or information from the applicant. If you have that. Thank you, Alex Cop, COPP, uh, for the applicant, Mr. Draper, filling in for Mr. Marcus here today. Um, obviously, we're here today to further review um, uh, two reports, I believe, uh, from soil scientists here. So I think the commission has the latest report from Mr. McManus, who's here today to speak as to his report and to address any issues that uh, the commission may think uh, have arisen as a result of Dr. Banzer's report or anything else the commission may want to raise. Um, I'll let the expert speak as to that report, but in brief review of Dr. Danzer's report, I don't think that there's anything other than conclusory kind of speculative allegations that there's some sort of impact, and um, I think that Mr. McManus and Mr. Mazzucco will speak more directly as to that, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that the Commission has. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, point of order. Um, would it not be appropriate to have Mr. Danzer's report summarized first? Before you let the applicant, applicant, you let the applicant speak first? Speak first yeah. Thank you. Good evening, uh, folks. Uh, Tim McMahon is certified professional soil scientist with JMM Wetland Consulting Services, offices in Newtown. I visited the site for the purpose of reviewing an off-site wetland located to the west of the uh, western property line. Um, I did that on uh, uh, Thursday of last week, uh, September 26, 2019. <clears throat> uh, after the review, it's, uh, it's a seasonally saturated to flooded wooded swamp, and a good chunk of it has very poorly drained soils with a 8 to 10 inches of uh, organic soils, we call a histic epipedon, which is uh, it's about you know this much of organics underneath the bedrock. It is a bedrock controlled wetland. It does have a, a fringe outside of the very poorly drained wetland part, <coughs> which is uh, uh, poorly drained soils. And there you go. I hung 13 flags, only 11 are shown. It just kind of bends away from the site. <coughs> Vegetation was red maple. Uh, the dominant uh, understory was sweet pepper bush, with some spice bush, and a uh, good chunk of uh, green briar, which was interesting to walk through. Um, like I said before, it, it is a perched water table here, uh, bedrock controlled. Um, it has a limited watershed. If you look at figure number two, line sort of outlines <coughs> the uh, watershed of that off-site wetland to the west. Uh, it's limited. Uh, the, the site comes from the bedrock outcropping to the west. Uh, drainage comes from the stone wall to the uh, south. And then stuff uh, drainage comes from the southeastern side where you see the two residences. And then it drains in the south southeasterly direction. And Mr. Mizuko can go through it a little further, but the actual site divide line is the stone wall. <coughs> so there is no drainage that uh, uh, discharges from the site. But the, the site drains to the north northwest, while this wetlands watershed is uh, south of the stone wall, which is that western property boundary. Uh, Eric Davison uh, from uh, Davison Environmental flagged the wetland along the uh, northern property line, and I just checked it for its accuracy, and I was in full agreement at what he did. 
you can see from the plans that uh, that wetland receives road runoff, stormwater runoff from a couple catch basins on the Excuse road. Excuse me, one second. I'm sorry, I didn't want to walk well, No worries. <coughs> For the record, Pat Barrafort, commission member. My apologies for being late. Jim, go ahead, sorry. And, uh, again, back to the pipe, takes uh, catch patients and sends it to that wetland, and it discharges and heads down uh, slope to the north, kind of northeast and the north uh, west, uh, into a wetland uh, well, well off site. Um, yeah, um, Mr. Danzer, or Dr. Danzer, did mention that this is a high-functioning wetland, and I agree with him. Um, however, like I said a moment ago, we do not drain to this wetland. There is a vegetated buffer, and if you look at my, I don't know if you have color pictures, but if you look at my pictures, one, two, actually one, two, three, and four. As you can see on the colored pictures, uh, the <coughs> understory is quite dense on all of them. Um, so there's, a, there's an adequate uh, buffer uh, from the stone wall to the, uh, the, the off-site wetland, which will protect its uh, water quality. It shouldn't change. Again, since our site goes the other way, and this site comes this way. Um, so I'm not anticipating at all any uh, significant physical impacts of this wetland due to that fact uh, from a uh, post-development condition. Um, that's about it. I mean, uh, the, the, the crux of it is we don't drain to that off-site wetland. This site doesn't, I should say. Anybody have any immediate questions? Thank you. That's it. Mike, did you have something you wanted to add? Or? No. The only thing I just want to add is that, you know, from the original regulated area line that we had shown was off of, which was the ponded area that we picked up from the aerial mapping, because originally that wasn't flagged. It was off-site. It wasn't something that was brought up even during the site walk. Nobody, you know, brought it up or said, you know, can you look into getting permission from the neighbor to flag it because we're concerned about it, right? No, it wasn't brought up. Um, but so we, the applicant, took the initiative to contact the adjoining property owner. They said they didn't have a problem with flagging it. So it was flagged, New England Land Surveying, they located the flags in the field. They sent me the digital information. I revised the plan. It shifted the regulated area line on the northern side in about eight feet from where it was originally. And then on the southerly side, <coughs> a little bit further away from the ponded area, it was about 16 more feet, which <coughs> adjusted the amount of area, the regulated area that we were working in from one tenth of an acre, which was original, to 0.16 acres now, with the increased uh, the amount of regulated area line that came into the site. So. And then the only other thing we did was just as an extra measure, I lined that whole side along the property line with a uh, hay uh, silt fence. So those were the those were the only changes. Um, I just updated the legend to reflect the additional flagging that was done by Mr. McManus uh, and picked up by New England Lands Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> At this time, we would like to give an opportunity to the um, attorney for the neighbors to be concerning the dangers. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, where would you like me to? You're going to be mostly addressing us. So okay. we'd like, you know, that'd be good. Like <laughs> Is this good? That's fine. Okay. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, my name is Dan Casagrande. I'm a partner at the law firm of Kramer and Anderson. The office is at 30 Main Street in Danbury. And I've been asked to be here uh, tonight by two of the neighbors who are two of the several neighbors that are uh, apparently in opposition to this project line, uh, Cornish and Kristen Geron. Um, the reason I'm here, and I'm not a soil scientist, I'm not, I'm not a wetland scientist, I'm a lawyer, but I have done 
um, a lot of land use wetlands work over the years, so I am somewhat familiar with the, the language. Uh, Mr. Danzer could not be here tonight because of the Jewish holiday, which he observes. And so the commission said, well, it should be Mr. Danzer or another professional. And so with that disclaimer that I'm not a wetland scientist, I just want to briefly summarize uh, Mr. Danzer's report, which is, does, does everyone have a copy of that report? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. We do. Okay. It's a six-page report. I find it interesting that the attorney for the applicant refers to it as conclusory when his own expert's report is two pages um, that we just got a few minutes ago. But in any event, you can, you can all read the report. I'm not going to go through it line by line. But just to summarize, he, Dr. Danzer, uh, assessed the off-site wetland that's on St. Mary's property. Uh, and it's within 100 feet of the property, western property boundary of the site, the subject site. Um, the, its geometry and the presence of leaf staining indicate that the wetland area does pool with water during the wetter portions of the seasons, uh, and leading him to conclude that this wetland area is a potential vernal pool. It's part, again, if you read Mr. McManus's report, he said this is an isolated wetland. Well, Dr. Danzer disagrees. He says that it's part of a fringe of a, it's a, it's a, it's on the fringe of a larger forested wetland corridor that drains southwesterly towards St. Paul Brook, about two-thirds of a mile downstream. And this wetland system serves as a valuable wild, wildlife corridor. So Dr. Danzer's point is that, at least based on his assessment, this is, it's not an isolated pocket, it's part of an ecosystem therefore worthy of more intense scrutiny than an isolated pocket. Um, the diversity of vegetation indicates a healthy and vibrant ecosystem. Um, it's capable, the wetland is capable of supporting a full assemblage of the amphibian and other wildlife. And as the bottom of page two says, it's, he believes, Dr. Danzer believes, that it's a, a valuable habitat for wetland-dependent wildlife. Again, the applicant's expert disagrees. On the next page, page three, he talks about the existing wetland hydrology. Again, as I read <coughs> the reports, the experts disagree. Mr. McManus says, no, the hydrology tra drains all the way up to the north. Nothing goes to the west. Dr. Dan Danzer begs to differ. He says that um, the concern is the northern portion of the off-site wetland system. The area of the wet, this area of the wetland is the most sensitive to any changes in hydrology caused by the proposed activities on the, on the site. Under existing conditions, this wetland area, Dr. Danger says, is hydrated by a combination of groundwater seepage from the base of the rocky slopes on the north and south sides, groundwater levels, and from overland flow during rain events predominantly from the east from the nine acre, the, the nine Good Hill property. 33% of the contributing wet watershed to this wetland area, according to Dr. Danzer, is located on the nine Good Hill property. And what is going to be the impact of the activities? According to Dr. Danzer, the development of the site will result in a reconfiguration, a rechanneling of the site's surface drainage pattern. Runoff will be generated, runoff generated by the site will be captured by the stormwater system, ultimately water routed to the north out of the watershed, which currently sustains the off-site wetland to the south. Under the current conditions, runoff flows through the wall on the western side and down the slope into the off-site wetlands on, on the St. Mary's property. Under the proposed condition, Dr. Dander's opinion is that there will be a 33% decrease in surface area to the watershed that sustains the area of the wetland concern, that is the area on St. Mary's and farther <coughs> south. This decrease, Dr. Danzer opines, is substantial enough to significantly impact the wetlands. So in other words, you have the opponent's expert saying that in his opinion, this project will cause a significant, or may have a significant impact, 
on the wetlands at issue. Again, the applicant's expert disagrees. Uh, Dr. Dandrew goes on to say on page four, the reduction of surface flow toward <coughs> St. Mary's, the wetland on St. Mary's, will reduce the wetland's hydro period, which will negatively impact the ability of the wetland to support wetland-dependent wildlife, such as salamanders and frogs, that require water in, in pools to breed. He then uh, has some additional uh, deficiencies that he points out uh, from the application that the wetlands, in his view, are not accurately mapped. Um, uh, and he believes that the upland review area, as depicted, is therefore not accurate. It is conceivable that the upland review area, currently depicted as an approximation, since the wetland was not flagged, actually tends more toward the interior of the site. In other words, it, it, you don't have adequate enough information. He also points out the lack of trees on the existing uh, Appendix C map. So his conclusion is uh, fairly straightforward. He says, based on the above observations, it is my opinion that the project that is currently proposed will have a reasonable likelihood of unreasonably impairing the natural resources, wetlands, and watercourses of the state of Connecticut due to an alteration of site hydrology due to the substantial 33% decrease in the watershed area that currently supplies surface flow to this wetland. So what does this tell us? Um, he independently mapped the wetlands uh, to the west on, se on 7 Good Hill Road, St. Mary's. It's part of a vibrant ecosystem, in his opinion. Its hydrogeology will be significantly impacted <coughs> by the site, uh, the development of the site, as proposed, and the alteration of surface flow will reduce the wetlands hydro period, thus impacting wetland dependent wildlife. It's our position, Mr. Chairman, that this is more than substantial evidence for you to deny this application as at the very least incomplete. <coughs> the law, and I note that Attorney Andrews is not here, but I can share the case law with him if he desires, is that you as a commission may deny an application uh, as incomplete. Um, that's the Unistar Properties LLC versus Conservation and Inland Wellness Commission case, 293 Connecticut 93. I can give a copy to uh, Ms. Kavagna if you'd like, but that case says unequivocally that Part of the Wetlands Commission's function, in fact, duty, is to deny an application when the facts on the record at least create an issue of whether the application is incomplete. And, and I would note, just for the just for the record, Dr. Danzer couldn't be here. My clients asked for an extension, adamantly objected to. Okay, so now here we are tonight. I have to get up as essentially a layperson and summarize my clients. Uh, or, or Dr. Danger's position, and now we have Mr. McManus, who in the last 48 hours uh, has put together uh, his own report and is criticizing Dr. Danzer, who can't be here. Now that's unfortunate because the applicant refused to the extension, but I question the fairness of that. Um, based on the Danzer report, not only can you conclude that this is incomplete, but you can also conclude that this proposal will or may have the like, a likely adverse impact on wetlands. As you, I'm sure you know the law in Connecticut is you can't just show the possibility of an adverse impact. You have to show the likelihood of an adverse impact in order to trigger a wetlands review. That's the River, uh, River Bend case. But Dr. D'Angelo's opinion shows there will be a likely adverse impact to this wetland and this habitat and this corridor. And it, will, it also gives you a basis to say that it's going to have a significant impact. I dare say that if this evidence were here at the beginning, the commission might have changed its mind about whether to hold a public hearing here because of this evidence of a significant impact. And again, all that supports a denial because you haven't held a public hearing. Now, as you know, experts often disagree with each other. But your job as the commission is to judge the credibility of those experts. 
Fortunately, Dr. Danzer can't be here. It'd be nice if you could see him and have him, you know, just not hear me summarize, but have him tell you what he thinks. But applicant has foreclosed that. But on this record, you can take into account the credibility of this presentation versus Dr. Danzer's presentation. And my conclusion is the prudent course for the commission under these circumstances is as the, the molds, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, in their letter to you said, there's just too many unanswered questions here. Why would you go ahead and approve this on, on these circumstances? And, and the last thing I'll say too is your regulations say that you can consider alternatives. Not only in a case where there's a significant impact, but you have the right to consider alternatives. Based on Dr. Danzer's opinion, would it not have been prudent for the applicant to say, well, we considered this other alternative, or we can reroute it so that it won't uh, result in a change in the hydrogeology. You don't have that opportunity because of the hearing. So I think, and our position is, the most prudent course here, deny the application is incomplete for the reasons I've suggested, require a resubmittal, and hold a public hearing. What's the rush? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> oh. I want to go on with the, with the commission. Hold on a minute. <coughs> Let me just think. Should they respond or not? It's up to you. Okay. Um, I will make a statement as chairman. <clears throat> um, I've been on this commission for 24 years. I've been chairman for 12. And this is probably one of the most difficult and complex applications I've ever had, processes that I've ever, ever, ever had to deal with. And um, I, I first want to ask if the Commission members have any final comments that they'd like to make or any final questions that they have before I continue with what I have to say. Anything? I don't. From the commission. I did have a question, if I may. Sorry. On um, this report here, the J. No, I'm sorry. Dan's. No, not oh, the Dan. Jim McMillan. Jim McMillan. And I'm sorry. That's Jim McMillan. Sir. Okay. Um, so in here, in one of the paragraphs, and I just look for certain words when reading, uh, development is likely outside the watershed of this off-site wetland. If there is any portion of this site that drains towards the wetland, it is exceedingly small. Um, is it outside the wetshed, uh, watershed? And is any other portion draining towards the wetland? There's, I don't, it's, yes. Jim McManus again for the record. <clears throat> if you look at again figure two, can I add to that question? I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> if you look at figure two, no, no, no. Okay. Okay. If you look, if you look at figure two, um, which is showing the watershed for the offsite wetland. <clears throat> Uh, and if you look at the site's property boundary, mm -hmm. a very, very small section does hit the property boundary. However, can you move? So there, there well, is a portion. There's a small it's not portion. It. There is a portion. There is a portion. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, for the record, Mike Mazuko, I just want to point out that this is the, on the existing conditions map. Mm -hmm. What the map that Jim is looking at is the aerial, aerial mapping. Mm -hmm. So this is a field topography map from New England land surveying. And you can see that the contours wrap like in this direction and it, and it turns and then heads this way. And you can look at this, mm -hmm. this is the 512 contour here that wraps around like this. So this is <coughs> heading in that direction. But if you look at spot elevations, you got a 513 and a half here and a 512. So this is flowing in this direction. So. Yep. This is more accurate than through the aerial mapping. It is it, true. I just, I, I'm, you know, reading both of these reports today, and 
I mean, I'm not a soil scientist. I just go from right. being 16 years on. And I see one report that's, you know, in bold letters saying this is what's happening. I see one report was like the if or likelihood. No. All right. That's not. I just want to make that, <coughs> make that clear. Saying at all. Okay. But to suggest that 33 percent is of the site is draining that way is, and it's going to be the watershed. Right. I'm not going back and forth. <laughs> I just was looking at the not, likelihood. That's not accurate. That's not going to happen. Okay. okay. And Go I'm not going by percentages. I just want a clarification on that. Part. Right. Right. I just want to add something to the record before you. It, it, and it's minor, but I just want to, it, it just sounds like there's a lot of reports and information and, and things of that nature going on right now. To add to that just a little bit, um, Friday we received the Danzer, mm -hmm. Danzer yes. report. Um, <clears throat> I went to go out to the site. David and I met on Saturday to yes. review it. Before I went, we had our meeting, I went out to the site and no trespassing signs were posted. They're newly posted. Um, I did not enter the property. Um, it has happened before with the applicant, and it was always we. I received an email saying um, on a previous application, I think it was 49 Taylor, that no trespassing signs were posted, and that if anybody wanted to go on the property to let you know. Absolutely. And this time, there was no such thing posted like that, so I was very, um, I did not feel comfortable entering the property because I didn't receive the normal correspondence that I've received in the past. It was recently that the signs were posted. There were no phone numbers or anything like that on it. So I was not going <coughs> to stir the pot or enter into other legal issues with the applicant by entering the property. So therefore, I wasn't able even to go out and observe where the wetlands were located. And I just want to note that for the record because I had to talk <coughs> to council, our land use council about that today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have received um, a lot of material in this application. Um, I've had a chance to go over some of it in detail, some of it very briefly. But the, the most overriding aspect is the fact that we have uh, different soil scientists with two with very conflicting opinions as to what's going on. And whenever we deal with cases like this, the Inland Wetlands Commission brings in a third party from uh, Northeast Conservation Services to review all, all soil scientists report. And <clears throat> that will take time, which we don't have. Um, I, I'm not in any way criticizing or, 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 or denying any of the information that's been given to us. It's been given to us by experts. And we have three soil scientists who are licensed by the state of Connecticut. So you can't say that one is better than the other, one knows more, or one is whatever. It is just a too complex of a situation. I've been thinking about this all weekend. I've been sleepless most of the weekend. And I believe the only way, the only fair way <clears throat> to deal with this situation is I have asked staff to draw up a resolution of denial without prejudice. And I will pre present that tonight to the meeting, to the commission, and to the applicant, and to the um, neighbors. Would you please hand that out to, to sure. everybody? David, you want to ensure that the um, attorney representing the neighbors receives a copy. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. <coughs> Here. Thank you. In the brief summary of this application in the beginning, we accepted the application for the review on June 24th, uh, opened the site plan review on July 22nd, continued <coughs> on August 5th, continued again on September 23rd, continued again this evening with a special meeting on September 11th. Um, and th there, there are too many special meetings, too much information that's conflicting for us to come up with a total positive 
decision one way or the other. So that's why I've asked for the denial without prejudice for the following reasons. And I'm making a motion that we deny this application without prejudice with these reasons. Written testimony received from separate parties, <coughs> Dan Zoo, PhD, Jim McManus, and Davison also, has conflicting opinions on whether or not the proposed site development activities will directly or indirectly adversely impact an off-site wetland or portion thereof within 100 feet of the bounds of the applicant's property. <coughs> the statutory time period remaining for the Commission to take action renders its decision inadequate. We only have two more days because no extension was given. And at this point, with, with all this new information, even if there were an extension given, given the fact that we wanted to we'll want to call in a third party, um, there would not be enough time for that third party to be able to thoroughly uh, look at the site and make his, his own report. Uh, number three, the applicant providing con conflicting indications for the commission to have access to their property, which is what Mrs. Cavagna was talking about. Um, <clears throat> should the applicant wish to resubmit an application, the commission provides <coughs> the following recommendations. A third party consultant that is neither beholding to the interests of the public at large nor the applicant should be retained by the Inland Wetlands Commission. Said consultant shall assess the existing conditions of the regulated upland review areas on the property the regulated wetlands areas from which they derive and supply a written report to the Commission including a functions values assessment. And lastly, they shall indicate whether or not the proposed activities, if unchanged, will create any direct or indirect adverse impacts to any off-site wetland or portion thereof within 100 feet of the bounds of the applicant's property. Uh, also, the Commission Land Use Department staff and their consultants shall have uninhibited access to any off-site wetland or portion thereof within 100 feet of the bounds of the applicant's property. The Commission and or any intervener shall be given written consent by the property owners to assess any and all properties where regulated exist that would be relevant to any future application for development of the property. And finally, a professional wetland scientist or registered soil scientist who review all off-site wetland areas during periods when they are most productive and can best provide information pertaining to wetlands functions and values. Now, the, this application review, was reviewed in accordance with Inland Wetlands and Watercourse Regulations in consideration to the Inland Wetlands and Watercourse Act and pursuant to Chapter 440 of the State of Connecticut General Studies 22A through 36 and 22A through 45 as amended. Do I have a second on this motion? Second. Uh, all those in favor? Yeah, discussion? Uh, oh, yeah, kind of just discussion. discussion, yes, okay. Um, I, I just like, I, I know a lot has been discussed about the wetland and the flow to the east, and I mean, to the west and to the north, just so, to be fair to the applicant, if he does wish to um, reapply, resubmit, just so you know what my mindset is, and I've discussed it before, that wall, I don't think we've ever approved an application that required an adjacent property owner to make adjustments to the property and I believe the way it's designed right now is that wall it would require or the I don't know the address of the center property to have to do some type of um, work or consideration to his own property and I have a concern with that I just wanted to make sure uh, applicant knew that before any other discussion from the commission? Right. Which wall are we talking about, Pat? Um, it's right in the middle. I'm sorry. The, oh, the, the, the center, the center, the center property right. going back. Gotcha. Um, the applicant did put extra drainage in there, which I appreciate. But I still feel we are creating an environment where the property owner that's adjacent will have to do some type of work or consideration to his property to accommodate. And I, I don't recall ever approving an application like that, like that, nor would I feel comfortable yeah. doing that. Again, I don't know how other members of the commission feel, but I want to make sure the applicant knew where I stood on that. So, Any other thank you. discussion from the commission? Okay. Thank you. Okay. And then do I have a second for this motion? Second. second. Okay, those in favor say aye. 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 And abstentions? Me. Okay, so we have four in favor and so many. Application is denied without prejudice. Be in motion to adjourn at the special meeting. You can't do anything else. Yep. Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. In favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.